In today's lecture, we'll be talking about the biochemistry of cell membranes and cellular communication. So these are our learning objectives. We'll first talk about what a cell membrane is and we'll continue on to why do we need a cell membrane? What exactly is the function of a cell membrane? And then we'll talk about what makes a cell membrane, what molecules can be found in the cell membrane, and hence what these molecules will do to contribute to the overall characteristics of a cell membrane. And finally, we'll also talk about how solutes and solvents are transported across cell membranes. And also, finally, we'll talk about cellular communication. So how does uh, one cell talk to another cell? And also, how does exactly one cell communicate with all the other parts intracellularly? We'll talk about the basics first. So what is a cell membrane? As you can see, this is a very nice microscopic picture of a cell and it's encased in a layer, like two layers actually, that we know as a cell membrane. So basically it's defined as thin and elastic layers which cover a cell and it's got so many different functions which we'll look at right now. So overall, I've summarized the function of cell membrane into seven points. The first function is as a boundary. As you can see, when we have a cell membrane, it will separate uh, our intracellular compartment with our extracellular environment. Secondly, it's for transport regulation because a cell membrane will definitely um, regulate whether or not something can pass or not into a cell and out of a cell and then it's also involved thirdly in signal transduction so how does a cell receive signal um, and how does it convey the signal into the intracellular compartment and then the fourth a lot of the components in cell membranes are actually capable of performing enzymatic reactions and that um, it itself is a, is a function of the cell membrane so it's responsible for several different enzymatic reactions and then finally actually not finally sorry the fifth function of cell membrane is that it's um, it's responsible for the contact uh, with other cells particularly when we're talking about tissue formation and then six is it can act as a cytoskeleton anchor another nice microscopic picture here we can see that the blue stain here is the nuclei of the cell and we've got the red membranes and here we have cytoskeletons which act to maintain the shape of a cell and this itself is anchored by the red cell membranes as we can see stained in this microscopic picture and then finally membranes are also wrapped around intracellular organelles and this is responsible for compartmentalization purposes so how do we separate the different organelles in the cell depends also on the performance of cell membranes now what is a cell membrane made of so here we're talking about the molecular composition of cell membranes and basically we have three main players or three main components of cell membranes and that is a lipid protein and carbohydrates typically in each cell membrane you would you would find a mixture of these three um, molecules, macromolecules. You can find a mix of lipids, proteins, and carbohydrates. Now, the thing is, we know that the body is made of um, different kinds of cell. You have brain cells, you have blood cells, you have liver cells. You have so many different kinds of cells with so many different functions. And hence, what we find is that the cell membrane of these cells are also different in composition. As you can see in the picture here, we have a nerve cell in your brain. And as we can see, it's mostly composed of lipid. Here we have lipids in yellow, and that makes up almost 70% of the cell membrane structure. Meanwhile, when you compare this to an erythrocyte or a red blood cell, you can see that the cell membrane is composed mainly of proteins, which is in um, brown. And so this, in, this tells us a lot about what exactly a cell does. And here we're going to talk a bit more about these different components. Why is a lipid so important? How, what kind of lipids make up a cell membrane? And same goes for proteins and carbohydrates. Okay, so we'll start with the first major component of um, the cell membrane, which is a lipid.
So basically, when we talk about the lipids of cell membranes, there is actually a lot of different lipids that can contribute to a cell membrane structure. The first, uh, but firstly, I would like to just show you a categorization of these lipids, just so that you can actually help to understand the structure better. So just forget about this section. Let's focus on two different lipids that is um, the main component of a cell membrane. And this is the phospholipid class and the glycolipid class. Now, um, the reason for why they're called phospholipids and they're called glycolipids, well, simply because this group contains phosphate. As you can see, there's a phosphate here. There's a phosphate group here as well. Meanwhile, the glycolipids group or the class has sugars so we have a mono or oligosaccharide here or mono or disaccharide here so that's basically the base um, the reason for why they are classified as phospholipids and glycolipids really simple simply put and here what I would like to point out is that these phospholipids and glycolipids are then further divided into subclasses. When you talk about phospholipids, you can divide them into glycerophospholipids and sphingolipids. Why are they divided into glycero and sphingolipids? As you can see, pay attention to the pink backbone here. This is the glycerol backbone, which is what makes up a glycerophospholipid. And this is the sphingosine backbone, which makes up a sphingolipid. And in both these cases, once again, we have phosphate group, which is why we're called glycerophospholipids and sphingo, um, sphingolipids, which is also a class of a phospholipid. Now, as you can see, pay attention to the yellow parts here, which indicates fatty acid. So all these lipids, of course, have fatty acids present. Now, when you move on to glycolipids, we can see that they can either have a sphingosine backbone or a glycerol backbone, just like these phospholipid classes. The difference being that they don't have a phospholipid, sorry, they don't have a phosphate group, but instead they have sugars present inside the molecules. Okay, so we'll go delve into these structures further, and I would like to first point out about glycerophospholipids because these make up the majority of cell membrane structure so let's look closer to what a glycerophospholipid look like I like to picture glycerophospholipid as a person with a very big head and two legs with one leg of is bent like just like this one so this big head here contains a phosphate group and a glycerol group Meanwhile, the backbone, sorry, and meanwhile, the legs are made of two different kinds of fatty acids, which is an un unsaturated fatty acid right here and a saturated fatty acid. So, as you can see, C1 is saturated and therefore it forms a straighter sh um, shape in comparison to C2, which is um, unsaturated. Now, as you can see, that there's a tiny little um, letter here, which is the letter R. R here indicates the functional group. And it correlates in this table with, a, um, with different kinds of uh, glycerophospholipids. So there's a lot of different glycerophospholipids. And we name them based on the functional groups here. If, for example, you have the head and the tail plus a hydrogen in your functional group, then you would call that glycerophospholipid as phosphatidic acid. If, for example... In the functional group, we have an ethanolamine um, uh, structure, then we call that a phosphatidyl ethanolamine. If, for example, in this functional group, you have a choline structure, then you would call that phospholipid phosphatidyl choline. So it's pretty simple in terms of nomenclature. You just look at the glycerol and phosphate head, you look at the tail, then you realize it's a glycerophospholipid. And then just to name it more specifically, look at the functional group to determine whether or not it's a phosphatidic acid or is it a phosphatidyl ethanolamine and so on. So this is just how do you name a glycerophospholipid. Now, one important thing about the characteristic of this phospholipid that I would like to point out, and this actually will contribute to the um, major characteristics of a cell membrane in general, is that glycerophospholipids are ampipathic. What exactly is ampipathic? It means it is composed of a hydrophobic structure and a hydrophilic structure. 
If you recall, hydrophobic means really scared of water and hydrophilic means really, really like water. So here we can see that the head of the glycerophospholipid is actually hydrophilic. It loves water. Meanwhile, the tail here is made of fatty acid, which obviously does not like water. So here we have two different um, two different preferences in one molecule. You have one side which loves water or is hydrophilic and one side which is hydrophobic or hates water and we call this whole thing amphipathic so it doesn't really know what it wants. And, that, and molecules like that we call an amphipathic molecule. Okay, moving on for the time being to sphingolipids. So sphingolipids are also... Um, often found in cell membrane structure and basically they also have a hydrophilic head and hydrophobic tails. Now the difference between sphingolipids and our previous glycerophospholipid is the backbone here. So as you can see the backbone in sphingolipid is sphingosine. The second difference is that we only have one fatty acid instead of two fatty acids that we saw in the previous molecule. So once again, same with the previous molecule, you have a functional group in blue and that correlates with the different possibilities that the blue functional group can be. So if the X here is actually a hydrogen, then we will call this sphingolipid ceramide. If this X group is a phosphocholine, then we will call this um, molecule a sphingomyelin. And sphingomyelins are very largely found in the cerebral or in the nervous system, and it makes up a large component of the uh, membranes of your neurons uh, or neuronal cells. So it's a very important phospholipid. And if you have a glucose here, then you would call that a glucosyl cerebroside and so on. So basically you can, you get the gist of, of the way we name these lipids. You can just look at what the functional group is and you correspond that to the appropriate names. Okay, now, not only is a membrane lipid made of um, glycerophospholipids and sphingolipids, but it's also made of uh, cholesterol. Cholesterol is a very familiar structure to you all, I'm sure. And in fact, it's also amphipathic in nature. Um, so how is it amphipathic? Well, it's got the polar part in the C3, carbon 3, and it's got the hydrocarbon side chain on C17 that is actually non-polar or hydrophobic. So hydrophilic hydrophobic means it's amphipathic. Now cholesterol we'll talk about later on on how it affects membrane fluidity and how or how flexible a cell membrane is. Moving on to the front oopsies okay sorry that it just jumped let me just go back so move, moving on to the time being to cell membrane proteins Right, so cell membrane proteins right here. All right, so we talked about all the different kinds of lipids that can be present in the cell membrane. Now we'll talk about the proteins. So membrane proteins as, um, are quite different to lipids in terms of function. When we talk about membrane lipids, they mostly give the structure and the um, fluidity of the membranes. But when we talk about proteins, then they give the actual function of the lipids because there's a lot of different proteins and they have different jobs. So we have structural proteins, receptor proteins, facilitator proteins for transportation and we also have enzymes now how do we classify these proteins basically in two different groups they can either be an integral membrane protein or they can be a peripheral membrane protein so from the name you can already tell that it indicates how the protein is attached when we talk about integral membrane proteins as you can see in the picture here they're pretty much embedded or they are stuck right into the cell membrane. You can see they're in the extracellular side and the intracellular side. So there's two different, um, uh, it's, it's present in both sides basically. Meanwhile, the peripheral membrane proteins, as you can see here, are only present in the outer part or in the peripheral part. 
and a majority of these um, membrane proteins. So what I would like to emphasize is that they function as receptors and this will be very important when we are talking about cell communication. So a lot of the proteins in cell membranes act as the receptors which will receive a signal um, from the outside of the cell and will then transmit the signal into the cell and tell the cell what to do. So this is a very big role for the proteins and we'll talk a bit more about later. And next let's talk about carbohydrates in cell membranes. Basically there's not really much to talk about for the carbohydrates in cell membranes. Um, they can be found bound in with either protein or lipids so they don't really they're not really found free form in the cell membrane but you can either uh, find them bound to a protein in which case we'll call them a glycoprotein or you can find them covalently bound to lipids in which case they're called glycolipid so free carbohydrate is rarely found in um, lipids and in fact the function of carbohydrates and lipids are not really significant compared to lipids and proteins Okay, so now we'll talk about how these um, structures contribute to the overall structure of the cell membrane. Now, the first characteristic that you need to know about cell membrane is that it's a lipid bilayer. What exactly does that mean? It's a layer, sorry, it's two layers of lipids. Now, this is the picture of the structure that we talked about first um, a couple of minutes ago. So this is the, um, the phospholipid that we talked about the one with the one big hydrophilic head and two hydrophobic tails what happens is that because these heads are hydrophilic you would find them facing out so they are facing outwards towards either the extracellular space or the intracellular space meanwhile with these such uh, with these fatty acids you would find them facing each other inside the lipid bilayer and this is what make this what con, this is what contributes to the overall characteristic of, of the structure of a cell membrane. And the fact that these non-polar tails face each other in the min, uh, in the middle to form the bilayer makes the membrane quite impermeable towards polar substances. Or it's um, you know they, if a um, polar substance tries to pass, then they would have to go through this very compact barrier of lipids so this is what makes us um, the cell membrane look like a cell membrane it's because we have so many phospholipids and they will form this structure that we call the lipid bilayer so remember that that the phospholipids will form the lipid bilayer so layer one and layer two and that's exactly how it looks like now the thing is is that we remember before well if you recall that um, a cell membrane is not only composed of a lipid but it's also composed of carbohydrates and proteins as you can see this is the complete if we already talked about uh, um, the lipid bilayer before now let's picture it in a more holistic fashion where you would have the integral proteins the peripheral proteins stuck inside you have the carbohydrates or the glycolipids here as well and when you have all those structures, it basically looks like a mosaic. So if you love doing art, you probably have made a mosaic before, where you would just compose an artwork made of different pictures and patterns. And that's exactly what a cell membrane looks like. You have this random patch of membrane, which is composed of different shapes and sizes of proteins and lipids and carbohydrates. That basically it looks like a mosaic. And the fact that the interactions between the proteins and the lipids and the carbohydrates are non-covalent in fact it's made of a weak force that we call the van der Waal force it makes the, um, the whole thing very fluid or very flexible and because of that we call cell membranes the fluid mosaic because it's very fluid and flexible and it looks like a mosaic so that's basically why the, um, we call the basic characteristic of a cell membrane as a fluid 